October the 19th, 1943. Alistair Crowley, perhaps the most famous and notorious British magician, wrote a letter to Jack Parsons, who's maybe the most famous and notorious American magician. I wish that you would realise, Crowley wrote, that my universe is very much larger than yours. And then, over the course of a couple of paragraphs, Crowley goes on to mention in some detail the amazing people that he has met over the course of his life, the amazing places that he has journeyed to, and the incredible and dangerous things that he has done. You may think it pompous of me to mention these matters, he continues, but the fact is that they don't matter unless you think they don't matter. The point I am trying to get you to realise is that any statement or action of mine is enormously modified by my having had these experiences. We might decide that Crowley is taking on a pompous and overbearing attitude to try to coerce Parsons into doing whatever Crowley wants him to do. And this could be seen as enacting some of the issues that arise when we encounter the figure of a magician. This is someone who may often claim to have had extraordinary experiences, impossible experiences, or who may present themselves as being in possession of strange and unusual powers. But is this person really who she or he claims to be? These are dilemmas that will surface when we encounter the archetype of the magician. However, on the basis that archetypes present us with universal modalities of being human, then maybe at different times, in different ways, we ourselves also come to embody this archetype to one extent or another. And then we have to ask ourselves, are we using our genuine powers to change reality in meaningful ways? Or is the way that we're using our abilities a kind of trick to manipulate or control others and to pass ourselves off as something that really we're not? If that's the case, then maybe it's not only others that we're fooling, but also ourselves. How do we recognise genuine magic, both in the hands of others and in our own? To begin to answer that question, I want to go back to that letter from Crowley to Parsons. Crowley describes the amazing experiences that he's had and the 
specialness that he feels this has conferred upon him. And then the fact is, he says, these things don't matter unless you think they don't matter. That maybe strikes us as a bit of a strange thing to say, a bit of a contorted expression to use. They don't matter unless you think they don't matter. One interpretation of this is Crowley saying that whatever Parsons chooses to think will inevitably be the case for him. But there's another possible interpretation of these words that takes us in a different direction. They don't matter unless you think they don't matter could be read as meaning if we think these experiences don't matter, then they do. In fact, could... Crowley be saying in this very (laughs) strange expression that we are obliged to arrive at the place where we think that these experiences don't matter in order to realise the sense in which they do. A kind of paradox might be being expressed here, a paradox that perhaps points to the attitude of a genuine magician. Suppose a person with no magical aspirations whatsoever had lived an amazing life, a worldly person, It would make no sense for them to think that those experiences didn't matter. Only somebody who somehow had access to something beyond or outside experience would legitimately be able to occupy a position where it would make any sense to say those experiences didn't matter, presumably in relation to what lies beyond experience. I wonder if this is what Crowley is pointing to in that letter to Parsons. Is he revealing his credentials as a true magician? to Parsons by demonstrating an awareness of how human experience only really matters when a person has had access to perspectives beyond that. In his depiction in the tarot The figure of the magician is subject to quite a degree of variance and some controversy. In the earlier decks, he's known as Le Batteleur, the wielder of the baton. He's a kind of juggler, a kind of mountebank or huckster. He's waving his baton in the air and he's standing before a table littered with knick-knacks, odds and ends that it looks as if he might be using for stage magic tricks or games. He's no doubt clever and skilled But at the outset, what predominates, perhaps, is the sense of him as a performer, possibly a con artist. 
It's only over time that he evolves into what we would recognise today as a magician, an occult practitioner. In the Rider Waite deck from the early 20th century, he's become a rather solemn looking and imposing young man dressed in religious looking robes standing before a table on which now are the pentacle cup staff and sword the recognisable magical implements of the western esoteric tradition the baton has moved from his left hand into his right now and he's holding it up aloft towards heaven, whilst gesturing, pointing towards the earth with his other hand. There's a fundamental question, a fundamental tension, perhaps, that infuses this figure. Is he earthly or is he spiritual? Is he a man of religion, or is he a con artist? Does he belong to the world, or does he have some kind of access to something beyond it? Suppose we, for some reason, find ourselves in some kind of mental distress, and in seeking a remedy we decide to consult a therapist. Who do we imagine this person is that by the power of their mere words, their mere presence perhaps, that somehow they will supply us with the means of relief? In The Psychotherapist, maybe we encounter a contemporary version of the archetype of the magician. And in seeking to understand what it is that this person might offer us, understandably we might turn at first to the objects <laughs> laid out on the table that the magician presents us with. And, indeed, in the way that therapy tends to be presented these days, there's very much a sense that it's the objects on the table that actually do the trick. The psychological tools and <laughs> techniques that the therapist hopefully has somewhere up their sleeve the exercises that they'll give us to do or the life hacks that they'll suggest and indeed these may prove very useful to us which is fortunate not only in the sense of being helpful but it also precludes the very difficult question of what it could possibly be that the therapist were doing if it weren't simply passing on the knowledge of the sorts of tricks and tactics that he or she has learnt in the course of their training and experience. I'd be inclined to accept this if it weren't for the fact that the magician, despite all the interesting things on his table, his gaze is not upon them, but focused elsewhere. And his hand holds up the baton towards the sky 
as if suggesting that it's from somewhere up above that he takes his inspiration. Personally, I don't believe in psychological tips and techniques. It's not that I don't think such things exist or that they can't be helpful, but simply that they're all a kind of trick, obscuring the fact that actually there's only one true life hack, the cultivation of awareness, attention, concentration, understanding, to change our lives, to alleviate our distress, we have to become aware and by understanding it, then attempt to change it. This is what the image of the magician in the tarot confronts us with, his aspect of the juggler, the mountebank, the huckster. And this is someone who we need to concentrate on very carefully. This is someone who forces us to remain extraordinarily aware both of what he's doing and of how we might become implicated in it. And even in his later guise as the ceremonial magician, he's still a character who affects us through directing our attention by unusual means in unusual directions. He's pointing simultaneously up to the sky and down to the earth. As above, so below, he's indicating. What manifests down here comes from somewhere else. And correspondingly, in therapy, what proves helpful, what the therapist maybe does, is lead us through attention and understanding to realising how the distress that we experience, the distress that manifests in the material world, has a meaning, has a reason. And we don't find meanings and reason in the material world. We have to look elsewhere for those. Inside, above, in the world of spirit. However we might want to describe it. And then we can start to think about how we might want that understanding itself to somehow begin to manifest in our everyday experience. When our distress begins to lessen, it'll be because we've done the work. The therapist has accompanied us and pointed things out. What perhaps they've really done is merely to direct our attention. They haven't really given us anything as such. We, all of us, sometimes find ourselves in the position of being the magician and confronting the dilemma that this poses it's so, so easy to get drawn into the idea that the objects on the table, the tricks, the techniques, the skills, the knowledge, 
are where the source of our magic actually resides. But they're not. That would merely be stage magic, illusion, trickery. The source of authentic magic comes to us through our connection with another place beyond the material world, beyond everyday experience. This is the realm of truth, meaning, reason, our values. Genuine magic proceeds from these and it's through awareness, attention, concentration, understanding that we make that connection. That's how we know when we're doing real magic rather than simply trying to control or manipulate situations through implementing devices or tricks, no matter how skillfully we might do that. The magician writes the anonymous author of Meditations on the Tarot is twofold. It has two aspects. He invites us on the path which leads to geniality and he warns us of the danger of the path which leads to charlatanism. I must add that often, too often alas, the teachers of occultism follow the two paths at the same time and that which they teach contains elements of genius mixed with the elements of charlatanism. But it's that path of geniality that I wanted to explore today. An aspect of the magician that maybe isn't presented as often in art and in popular culture as the aspect of the charlatan. Chaucer's The Franklin's Tale is based on a form of story that's much, much older. It tells of the honourable knight Averagus, who falls in love with the beautiful maiden Dorigan and successfully woos her and brings her to live with him at his castle in Brittany as his wife. They're very happy together, but to seek wealth and honour, Avaragus is called away to England. And left to her own devices, Dorigan, at home in the castle, pines for him and spends hours and hours looking out to sea, vainly hoping to glimpse Avaragus's ship bringing him home to her. And as time goes on, she starts to develop a slightly unhealthy fixation with the treacherous, sharp rocks that are a prominent feature of the Brittany coastline. She starts to worry that Avaragus' ship, when one day it does arrive, it might get wrecked upon these dastardly rocks. Meanwhile, whilst Dorigan is home, alone, pining for Avaragus, she catches the eye of a squire, Aurelius, who falls in love with her and starts to become somewhat infatuated. He declares his passion to her, but she's not interested. She loves Avaragus, but to let him down gently, she tells him 
she'll marry him on condition that he rids the coastline of Brittany of all its treacherous rocks. Of course, this is an impossibility. But Aurelius hits on the idea of consulting a magician. The magician is a young man, unnamed in the story, who convinces Aurelius through a demonstration of his magic that he can make the rocks of Brittany disappear in return for what then was the astronomical fee of £1,000. Much to Dorigan's horror, she realises when Aurelius calls on her and invites her to take a look. All the rocks from the coastline of Brittany have indeed vanished. And now, by her promise, she's obliged to marry Aurelius. The only way out she can think of at this point is suicide. And it looks as if the story might be heading towards a tragic conclusion. But this is where things take a different turn. Avaragus returns home. Dorigan goes to him and confesses what has happened. Of course he can't bear the thought that she would kill herself but he understands that it would be dishonour if she broke her promise. So, acting out of love for her, he sets her free from the marriage and gives her permission to marry Aurelius. Yet when she goes to Aurelius and tells him she will keep her promise and that this is with her husband's agreement, Aurelius is so touched by the bond of genuine love between them that despite his infatuation with Dorigan, he recognises it would not be right to proceed. However, the debt of a thousand pounds to the magician remains, even though all that money hasn't bought him what he wanted. But then, finally, the magician, when he hears from Aurelius what has happened, he cancels the debt entirely and tells Aurelius that he owes nothing at all. Chaucer's Franklin ends his tale with a question to the audience. Who is the most virtuous person here? he asks. It's not often that we're set the puzzle of working out the most virtuous person in a story and there's no one obvious candidate. But I'm going to make a case for the magician in this tale. Each of the characters in the story acting out of kindness and generosity sets free the person who becomes obligated to them. And the magician deserves special commendation in this respect, I think. Because he's the one who creates the debt, the obligation, out of nothing in the first place. When Dorigan makes her rash promise to Aurelius, It shouldn't have ever been possible to make the rocks of Brittany disappear. Yet the magician, by making the impossible possible, he creates that debt. And that sets up a chain of obligations between the characters. That winds its way among them. Until at the end, it comes back to the magician who makes it finally disappear. This is the aspect of the archetype that perhaps we should seek to emulate. We do our thing in the everyday world with 
the knickknacks in front of us on the table, our skills, our knowledge, our tools, our techniques. And if people are happy with what we do and we do no harm, then why not <laughs> even get paid for that? But it's important not to mistake the means for the end. Not to mistake this for real magic, the actual work of magic. Which is about bringing down the ideal from the spiritual world into manifestation. And when we're doing that, it's always ultimately in the service of love. <laughs>